So um, just give me a second and I'll give you a thumbs up when it's all good to go. Okay. Okay, well, it just told me we're live. Okay, sure. I'm going to start now. Go for it. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to today's library lecture. Today, we have Dr. Selena Hapel presenting What About si Citizen Science Can Tell Us About Puffin Declines and North Pacific Climate Change. Before we begin the lecture, there are a couple announcements. The photo contest ends on August 15th. There will be another Puffin Watch on August 22nd from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is our farewell to the Puffins. Um, the Cannon Beach Art Association exhibit focused on Haystack Rock is being sponsored by Friends of Haystack Rock and proceeds will be donated to us. The final lecture from the extended Puffin series is on the 8th of September and the Earth and Oceans Festival is on September 16th through the 19th, so make sure to mark your calendars. Now, let us move on to introducing our speaker. Dr. Selena Hapel is a professor of fisheries ecology and head of Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences at Oregon State University. She has studied West Coast fish, fisheries and ecosystems for the past 20 years working with state and federal agency scientists, conservation groups, fishermen, and coastal residents on issues such as the West Coast ground fish crisis, Oregon's marine reserves, and the importance of forage fish and marine food webs. Dr. Hapel is a strong prominent figure of citizen science and active engagement of the public in marine science and conservation. She will review the available science on tufted puffin declines, including data collected by citizen scientist, Dr. Hapel, and will provide information from NOAA's integrated ecosystem assessment to review these impacts and their possible links to puffin declines. So without further ado, um, Dr. Selena Hapel will present her research. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. And thanks everybody for inviting me. It's wonderful to uh, get a chance to chat with the uh, friends of Haystack Rock and other folks on the North Coast there. Um, I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but it also gives us an opportunity to uh, uh, maybe have a few who wouldn't be able to join us if we were in person. So we're all kind of getting used to the Zoom thing at this point anyway, I think. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, get this thing going. Sorry for the delay tonight. Just a few technical difficulties. All right. And uh, Andrea, if you could just let me know that you can see that. All right, great. So um, I'm going to talk tonight about a few different things related to um, puffins and uh, the, the concerns that we have about them and how that's linked to climate change and fisheries. Um, my, I want to tell you a little bit about me first, though. Um, I'm a department head at, at Oregon State. I'm a mom. I'm a professor. Uh, and I'm also at the moment faculty senate president, which is keeping me pretty busy. Um, I'm, but my work is in marine fisheries ecology and uh, conservation. And I've been doing this kind of work for quite a while now uh, in graduate school. And uh, my first few years, I spent a lot of uh, effort working with sea turtles and uh, figuring out uh, how to conserve sea turtles, uh, what the best management strategies would be, and then also uh, how to reduce bycatch in fisheries for sea turtles and uh, doing the uh, population dynamics and computer simulations to determine uh, what's the sea turtle status and likely uh, changes through time might be. So but what people don't know so much about me is that in, the, in my past, I wore a puffin suit. Uh, when I was a volunteer at the Seattle Aquarium when I was a kid starting at age 12, um, I gave talks about seabirds and occasionally did the talk about seabirds in a puffin suit. Um, I came to love the seabirds there at the aquarium, the alcids in particular, and uh, one of my best friends was Miss Piggy, uh, the tufted puffin. And in fact, Miss Piggy even got loose one day and uh, gave me a good bite when I grabbed her to put her back in her uh, enclosure. 
Um, but I, uh, in spite of that, I've had a long-term uh, love of seabirds and puffins in particular. Uh, and who wouldn't love these guys? I mean, look at them. <laughs> They're adorable. So, um, but my own background isn't in seabird ecology so much as fisheries ecology. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, and I am sure that with these lectures and these events that you've been having about puffins, you probably know some of the stuff I'm about to tell you. But since I'm sort of going back to my roots as a 12, 13 year old at the Seattle Aquarium in my puffin suit. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about uh, some basics of puffin uh, natural history. Um, importantly, they, they nest underground in burrows, which you can imagine kind of makes them hard to count. Um, they lay one egg each year. They're a deep diver, they're an alcid, so they fly underwater rather like uh, penguins actually, but they also can fly in the air. Um, and they eat small fish like capelin, sand lance, uh, juvenile, herring, anchovy, and so on. Um, they winter in the North Pacific and have a breeding range uh, throughout Alaska and down our coastline. And I'm sure you've seen the puffins at the aquarium and hopefully on the uh, Oregon coast um, where we get, um, we're lucky enough to see them from our boat occasionally. So one thing I learned through putting this talk together um, is that rhinoceros aquats are actually puffins, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, and it all has to do with this, uh, this wing pattern that they have uh, and how their wing is structured. And the rhinoceros aquat is actually a true puffin. Uh, so that, you know, you, it, it's, it's always that you learn something new every day, I think. Uh, so that's, uh, it's, these are the puffins that we have uh, around here, tufted puffins and rhinoceros aquats. The horned puffins are further north uh, than we are most of the time. Now, I do population dynamics work. And so things that are really interesting to me are things about what we call the life history of an organism. So things about how long it lives, how many offspring it has, and so on. And one of the fascinating things about seabirds is they live a really long time. So albatross can live 50, 70, 80, 90 years. Murs, 20 to 25 years, gulls, 15 to 40 years, and puffins at least 20 years. And the, law, and the record, according to the Audubon website, is 36 years. So they're very long-lived as birds go. Um, but they don't have very many babies every year. Um, so an albatross might only have one chick every three years or every two years. Um, some of them do have a chick every year. MERS, one to two chicks uh, a year, depending on what species and where they're at. Gulls, two to three chicks. And puffins, one chick per year. And uh, uh, you can see an, uh, an egg there. And what that means is that those puffins live a long time, but it takes, they, with only one chick per year, they're not actually over the course of their lifetime going to have very many offspring. And one of the reasons for that is that raising a chick in, uh, if you're a puffin or a, uh, an alcid in general, um, takes a lot of work. So one chick per year, and both parents need to work to incubate the egg and bring fish to the chick. And the parents lose a lot of weight during that breeding season while they're paying more attention to their chick than to themselves. Um, as most parents know, that, that that does happen for all of us. Um, and so that incredible parental investment means that you don't have a lot of babies, but you put a lot of energy into each one. Now, we're worried about puffins, and there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, around the world that puffins and other seabirds are in trouble. So, uh, and one of the reasons for that is climate change and uh, perhaps causing some large die-offs in seabirds like puffins. So, when uh, the, a lot of the work that I do with sea turtles and other uh, marine organisms is to uh, look at what are the threats and what are the potential causes of a population decline. Because if we can understand the, the underlying causes and how much impact those threats are having, then we can develop conservation and mitigation strategies to try to help. So for pretty much every species that becomes endangered, these are the typical threats, habitat loss, introduced species, overharvest, uh, pollution, and climate change. So let's look at puffins and the situation there. Habitat loss, in some areas, you've got a lot of coastal development. 
Uh, for puffins, since they're nesting up on cliffs, the sea level rise isn't usually too much of a problem, but it is certainly uh, increased storm events and so on uh, could definitely be affecting habitat loss. Then you've got introduced species. So rats, diseases, and so on, uh, definitely a factor for a lot of alcids, including puffins. Overharvest. So historically, and in many parts of the world even now, uh, puffins are used for food. And um, not so much in too many places anymore, uh, but there is still puffin harvest for food in uh, Iceland and some other parts of the world. And then, of course, there's indigenous harvest of seabirds uh, in uh, the northern areas of um, Alaska and places like that. So, um, but really, uh, the other over harvest that's occurring is uh, in potential fisheries interaction. So, you could have uh, bycatch of puffins and other alcids in fishing nets or entanglement in gear um, and, uh, and so on. So over harvest is a factor, probably not a major one at this point. Pollution, of course, plastics in the ocean. We've all heard a lot about plastics in the ocean and puffins would be susceptible to those uh, plastics uh, as much as many other birds. And then climate change, and that's what we're going to focus on a little bit more today, specifically reductions or redistributions of the prey resources that the puffins need. So those forage species that they depend on. So some common seabird prey species uh, that are relevant for today are thinking about krill, herring, anchovy, smelts, sand lance, juvenile salmon, so, and sardine. So here's just a few pictures. There's a, a krill here. This is a sand lance. This is a sand lance doing its sand lance thing in the sand. Uh, they're very cute. They bury down in the sand. Uh, and a herring here. So there, you might see on this list several species that are also important to people. So it's that balance of the ecosystem and how we utilize things in the ecosystem that really comes to play when you also have impacts on the ocean ecosystem due to climate change. So I was involved in a, an exercise uh, led and supported by the Lenfest um, Forage Fish Task Force. And this was a group of scientists from all over the world that uh, got together. We got together uh, several times and evaluated what's going on with forage fish worldwide and, and forage fish fisheries as well. And here's some things uh, that are just important to note about forage fish. And I'm going to include krill in a lot of this. Uh, now, of course, krill are not fish, but they fulfill the same uh, space in the ecosystem that uh, we're talking about with these forage species. So forage fish are essential components of marine ecosystems, and they're a critical prey item for most seabirds. They are important in many fisheries worldwide. They're highly productive and short-lived. They fluctuate a lot on their own, in part because they're highly productive and short-lived, but they also respond a lot to environmental change. And they're hard to count. Uh, now, fish in the ocean are hard to count generally, but when you're, it, the fish are only uh, a few inches long and occur in high abundance, often very close to shore, they can be really hard to count. Now, where do forage fish fit in in the grand scheme of world fisheries? Well, this is a, a graph showing world capture fisheries over time, as well as aquaculture production. And this is from the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, organization in uh, the United Nations. And they put out these reports every two years. And what you see is that capture fisheries, so fisheries that are for wild fish, have really leveled off. Uh, over the last 15 years. And they've leveled off at about 90 million metric tons. Aquaculture, on the other hand, has uh, increased and continues to increase. Now, I don't really have a sense of how much 90 million metric tons is, but I'll tell you uh, in terms of weight that the Empire State Building weighs 330,000 metric tons which means it would take the weight of 273 Empire State Buildings to equal the weight of the annual reported world fish catch. And about 80% of that world fish catch is forage fish. 
what do we use those forage fish for? Well, I got a chance uh, to go to the anchovy uh, processors in Peru to see what this is all about. And this is just a bunch of anchovy that have been uh, taken from a ship, uh, a large uh, purse saner that has brought in uh, these all these small fish. They're uh, being loaded. This is uh, just a small fraction of what was taken off of one boat one day while we were there. And you see that the uh, anchovy are headed into the processor and uh, they're gonna be turned into fish oil, which was described to us as liquid gold, uh, not only because it's a beautiful gold color, but because it's worth a whole lot of money. And then it's also turned into fish fertilizer and animal feed. So forage fish are really important for those products. But forage fish can also be really important for human food. And we also visited a little town, uh, Paracas in Peru, and we got to see a fishery coming in. These are small boats uh, and they were filled with these little fish, these little forage fish. Um, and that same FAO report says that in 2017, fish accounted for about 17% of total animal protein and 7% of all proteins consumed globally. And fish, this is important, fish provided about 3.3 billion people on the planet with almost 20% of their average per capita intake of animal protein. And because forage fish is a significant component of that, it's really important to recognize the importance of forage fish for humans. But they're also really important for birds and marine mammals and fish and a whole bunch of other things in the ecosystem. Forage fish sit smack in the middle of the ocean food web where we have the forage fish feeding on plankton, uh, primarily zooplankton, the animal component of, of plankton. And then the forage fish themselves are being eaten by fish that we consume, Chinook salmon, albacore tuna, lots of other species. They're eaten by marine mammals and they're eaten by seabirds. So when there's an impact on forage fish, whether that's human caused or climate change, which is also human caused, then you have a constriction in that food web that affects a lot of things, a lot of these animals that we care about. And what we discovered in this Lenfest Forage Fish Task Force is that the economic importance of forage fish is very high, a direct value of the catch of about $5.6 billion per year. But the supportive value, the fact that forage fish are food for other fish that we want to catch and eat, the supportive value is twice that. So this really kind of changes your equation generally about how we view forage fish and the importance of forage fish in the ecosystem relative to the importance of forage fish in, uh, on our plates, so to speak, or in our animal feed and fish oils. Off the coast of Oregon, here's the forage species and the, and the management of them. Krill harvest is banned. This is something, this was a preemptive uh, move by the Pacific Fishery Management Council to ensure that krill, which are an absolutely critical food source for many other fisheries, uh, are not commercially harvested off our coast. Sardine are regularly assessed and they have a harvest cutoff for the ecosystem. So if the population or the, the, the weight, the estimated biomass of all the sardine off the Pacific coast goes below a certain level, they will halt fishing altogether. Mackerel also have a harvest cutoff for the ecosystem. Anchovy have recently been assessed and they have a very low catch limit. Herring are state managed uh, and are pri that's primarily a bait fishery. Smelt are also, also state managed. Eulicon are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So there's particular efforts to reduce bycatch, for example, of Eulicon. And then sand lance and a bunch of other little guys that uh, the birds care about, but we generally don't, are not assessed or managed. 
And the thing is, there can be a whole lot of year to year variation in these species. So this is just an example from a, a fisheries paper that looked at northern anchovy, sardine, hake, rockfish, and so on. And the up bars are the years when there were more than normal numbers of anchovy. And the down bars are the years when there were fewer than the normal than the average uh, number of anchovy. And you see that some of these really bounce around and like krill over here, you see there's a couple of really big down years. Those are El Nino years. So krill production can be heavily impacted by El Ninos. You can also have periods where things just kind of go up and down. And then you can have periods where you have several good years in a row followed by several bad years in a row. So there's a lot of variation in these species. And the conclusions of the LENFEST task force work were that, as we knew going into the work, that their forage fish are hard to count, they fluctuate in abundance, and they're highly productive, and they're very important to the ecosystem. Their indirect value generally exceeds their direct value to fisheries around the world. If we want to eat them or feed them to other animals that we eat, we need to devise management strategies that are more conservative than we typically use for other fisheries management to make sure that enough of those forage fish are left in the ocean to support the ecosystem and the other fisheries that we care about. And then ecosystem monitoring and adaptive management approaches are needed, especially with climate change. So because these are short-lived and highly fluctuating species, we actually have to keep pretty close tabs on them because they could spiral down very quickly, potentially, and then take a lot of the upper trophic levels, the, the predators, along with them. So how do we monitor forage species in the California current system? Well, most of the work that we do is through acoustic surveys from ships. But now there's some new technologies coming on, like these sail drones here that are un unmanned uh, vehicles that uh, are solar powered and that just drift along. They have it. Well, they don't drift. They actually uh, move in a directed fashion along a transect and they collect data using acoustics uh, so they can see how many, um, where the forage fish are. And then we can also use bird and mammal diets. So like this turn here, you can see all the white around here. These are fish bones, including the ear bones or otoliths from fish. And we can uh, just look at those uh, leavings of the birds and figure out what they've been eating um, and, and in what relative abundance. Uh, we can also look at the uh, scats from marine mammals for this. And uh, there are a lot of surveys that happen off the Oregon coast and in the California current ecosystem. So we have uh, adaptive surveys. These are surveys where uh, additional lines or transects are added to a survey. We have compulsory. These are surveys that are done every year. There are marine mammal surveys. There are sail drone surveys. And then there are uh, just surveys that happen because you're in transit from one area to another. And this is what acoustic data look like. Uh, it just looks like blobs to us. But the scientists that do this work actually can tell from the signal that they get from the sonar uh, what species it's likely to be. And if they can't tell, then they can potentially collect water samples uh, or uh, for DNA to see what species it is, or send cameras down or send nets down to see what the uh, globs actually are. But it's amazing how well they can actually tell what the different uh, groups of forage fish actually are just from these uh, red and, and purplish globs on a screen. And all those data go into a variety of models and management exercises and assessments, including something called the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. And uh, that ecosystem assessment, you can go to the website and you can see the large scale oceanographic indicators. And then they show a whole bunch of different indexes of different species around the California current and what's going on with them, what their trends are, what their current abundances are, and so on. 
And one of the things that they're tracking a lot right now are what they're calling marine heat waves. So the, this is a recently characterized index that tracks higher than normal ocean temperatures that are expected for a given area. And, um, and these, this was developed because of something you may have heard about the North Pacific blob, which was basically a lens of warm water that affected productivity in much of the North Pacific. Now, what's interesting to note is that if you look at the data for marine heat waves, the, 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 the variance and the maximum intensity right now is not terribly different from what it was in the past. And in fact, in some years in the past, it was a lot greater. The variability was a lot greater. But what's changing is the amount of ocean that's affected by the heat wave. So you see, this is the blob, okay? These, this is the amount of ocean up to eight well, really closer to 10 million square kilometers affected by the heat wave. Uh, and you see the other bad news is that right now we're still in a marine heat wave, according to these indexes. So this is what the birds are dealing with. And we're just trying to catch up now and understand what the long-term impacts of that might be on their forage species, which then translates into effects on the birds themselves. The ecosystem assessment has several indicators and you can click through. It's a fun website to play with actually, because you can go to look at different um, indicators and see what their trends have been over time. Uh, increasing, no trend or decreasing. And generally that's over a, the recent five year trend. And then they also tell you how many years of data are available. Um, and seabirds are one of the indicators that they uh, use in the assessment. So here's, um, first I'm gonna talk about the forage availability. So of some of the species that we've been talking about, you see that some are increasing and some, but a whole bunch are decreasing. So adult anchovy and adult sardine, Adult sardine in the, nor in the Northern California current are way too big for a puffin to eat, by the way. Um, but those are increasing. Market squid are stable, but krill are decreasing. This is over the last five years. Mctophids are about stable, but then a whole bunch of these, Y-O-Y -Y stands for young of the year. So these are baby fish basically that are important prey and they're all going down. You'll notice sand lance isn't on this list. That's because nobody monitors sand lance. So we don't really have any idea what's going on with sand lance. Bottom line here is that many forage species that seabirds depend on are declining while others are stable or increasing. The, but, but the key is that the availability of food impacts seabird survival and reproduction. And even though the birds do switch, they, they will switch from one prey type to another that's more abundant, but not all prey types are actually available to them. And sometimes their regular prey like krill are in deeper water because the water above them is too warm. And so they go deep. And so then the birds can't reach them. So, and then finally, not all foods that the birds might be able to catch have the same amount of calories. So some food is better than others for them. Some food takes less energy or more energy to capture in the first place. So even though they can do some switching, it's not quite that simple. It's not just, you know, trading carrots for Big Macs. <laughs> that doesn't really work too well, right? So we need to um, also understand how all those different forage species are important to different species of birds. So now let's get back to puffins to finish up here. So how can we monitor puffins and how do we know if their populations are in trouble, especially something like a tufted puffin that's nesting in burrows that are hard to see and difficult to reach? Well, you can look at the integrated ecosystem assessment data in uh, for seabirds because like I said, they are an indicator, uh, a set of indicators for the assessment. And what you see here um, is that a big, a large proportion of the indicators that they use are dead birds on the beach. And the way that they count or get information on how many dead birds there are on the beach is through citizen science programs. One of the most important indexes of seabird abundance in the, in the annual assessment is mortality measured by the number of dead birds recorded on beaches by citizen science programs. 
and that includes uh, Beach Watch, Beach Combers, and the one I'm going to tell you about, which is Coast. So Coast uh, is a citizen science group. Some of you may have heard of them, uh, and they're based out of the University of Washington. Why do we care about dead birds? Why would we count them? Well, there's a lot of dead birds on the beach. Those of you who walk the beach every day know this. They were in fact once alive, so they are an indicator of something. They can be identified by anyone uh, with the proper training. They can be thoroughly examined and are easily photographed, unlike live birds. And they actually contain a lot of valuable information. And one of the things that the citizen science data allow us to do is to create a baseline to understand what's normal and what's abnormal. So generally speaking on our coast, we have a, a cyclical pattern that starts with a post breeding mortality. Remember I mentioned that the birds, it's, it takes a lot of energy to raise a kid. Well, quite a few seabirds die after expending that energy. So there's often a peak in dead birds on the beach after breeding. Then we have a winter kill event that sometimes takes place because the birds are smashed up by storms or they can't find the food they need. And then some birds like rhinoceros auklets have a spring migration that's also very energetically costly and there's sometimes a little bump in the data there. And so we have kind of a baseline of, of this pattern each year and we can compare the data from one year to the next and see when some of the uh, actual signals that actual counts of dead birds really jump up above that baseline expectation of how many dead birds there should be on the beach or are normally on the beach. And this becomes really important when we're talking about climate change and the long-term data sets provided by COAST have enabled a lot of really interesting research to be done, including linking the mass mortality events to changes in ocean productivity due to temperature rise. So this is a complicated figure, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of it, but um, I encourage you to go to the Coast website to look more closely. And you see for different parts of uh, the coast here, so up in Alaska, Chukchi Sea, North Bering Sea, South Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska, then Washington and Oregon, and then California and Northern California. And you see that uh, the temperatures over time you see are getting, uh, you're seeing a lot more of this dark red color where the sea surface temperatures are greater than two degrees above normal. Now, in the past, before 2014, you see there were um, a few mass mortality events. So each one of these bubbles is just showing the size of the circle is showing the uh, relative size of the mortality event, the number of birds that died. And you see that they have occurred and it's been different species over the years. But recently, since 2014, things have changed. We're seeing a lot more of these mass mortality events and they're much larger. And sometimes those mass mortality events are these alcids that we care so much about. Here's an example, a critical puffin mortality event that was recorded by coast volunteers up in the Privilof Islands in the Bering Sea, specifically at St. Paul Island. The first day they went out, 39 carcasses, mostly tufted puffins and mostly intact were found. And they, over the course of that season, this is winter 2016, 17, the number of dead birds was 60 to 70 times normal rates with 357 carcasses found and 76% of those were adult puppet, tufted puffins. Total mortality estimate was uh, seven to 13,000 birds. Now, we know that this was an abnormal event, not just because there were a whole lot of dead birds, but also because it, there were many, many more dead birds than normal. And the ecosystem conditions that were taking place at that time were incredibly high sea surface temperatures um, that were affecting the distribution of prey and in all likelihood, at least the health of the birds, if not actually leading to starvation. 
the mass mortality events, uh, this was actually published uh, and many of the COAST data sets have been uh, used by scientists in uh, different fields and in, in agencies and universities to better understand when, what these mass mortality events mean and how they're related to ocean conditions. So citizen science is critical for seabird conservation. And the reason why is because the, the, it's large scale. By having citizen volunteers doing the data collection, we're able to monitor thousands of miles of beaches. There's no way an agency could ever afford to do that. And we can monitor those beaches far more frequently. We can identify that baseline and what's normal so that we can really tell when an abnormal event has occurred. It's relatively inexpensive, but it's not free. <laughs> and it's a great opportunity. This is one of my favorite things about citizen science. It's just a great opportunity to welcome everyone into the science community. Um, there's no reason why we can't all be scientists. In fact, kids are all scientists. So I really love citizen science programs because it welcomes everyone and we can all uh, work together to collect the data and try to understand what's going on out there. So I've got a bunch of resources here that I'm going to pass along to folks uh, uh, to, with the Haystack Rock group to uh, if you'd like to look up some of these additional resources. And of course, I want to thank my uh, my friend and co-author Julia Parrish at University of Washington and the Lenfest Forage Fish Task, Task Force team. All right. So thanks very much. And I guess we can answer some questions. How do we do this, Andrea? Um. Hannah should have some questions from the Facebook Live. Oh, excellent. But, okay. So She has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was going to ask, um, I think you mentioned like very offhand that the anchovies in the California stream are too large for puffins to eat. Like, how does that happen? Sardine. Like, sardine, sardine, not anchovies. Okay. So, how so are they yeah, anchovy are little tiny guys. Mm -hmm. But um, th when, the, when the sardine make it up as far as the north pacific they're really big fish okay compared to, compared to little sardines that are further <laughs> south because <laughs> i was like i'm pretty sure sardines are like tiny like how are they getting to the okay. sardines that you get in the can are pretty small right yeah actually, exactly exactly sardines can get really big and okay. in the north pacific they're quite large i don't know you know if a, if a puffin well, puffin can eat something pretty darn big, but mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 sardines I've seen are you know eight nine inches long sometimes. So oh wow, that's a big sardine. <laughs> Got it. Cool. Thank you. So Selena, I just want to thank you so much um, for giving this talk. It was a wonderful talk. We do have a couple of questions. Great. Um, our first question is actually, how can somebody get involved with Coast, and is it just in Washington? or is it all along the uh, Pacific Northwest? Uh, Coast has, uh, you can go to their website, um, coast.org, and they do trainings. Uh, they have uh, volunteers throughout Oregon and Washington and in uh, Washington on the outer coast, as well as the Salish Sea. Um, and then the Oregon group goes all the way along the coast and then down into Northern California as well. So, okay. And you can look up, you, if you go to the website, you can find out when a training is occurring. So one of the things about COAST um, and, and some other citizen science programs is they spend a lot of time, um, a fair bit of time training their volunteers in how to identify the birds. You never pick up the birds, by the way. You look at them and measure them and identify them and take a photo and then that photo is what gets sent to University of Washington you put in your data set what you think it is and then somebody confirms that from your photo okay so that program takes uh, some time to learn how to identify dead birds but there but it turns out you can identify a dead bird if all you have is his foot because dead, because seabird feet are very unique and you can usually identify all the way to species just based on a foot. 
So they teach you how to do that in these um, in, in the in the volunteer training program. And then uh, as you get better at it, you you can um, you know get your data uploaded into the into the database and um, have it and then get feedback and reports uh, for your area and look on the website to see what the trends are. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Um, so then actually the uh, only other comment was from Vanessa and she was wanted us to let you know that she loved this talk and it was so interesting. Um, and she wanted to know if we were going to post the PowerPoint that you made on um, our chat. But what we're going to do is this is being recorded live, so it'll actually be available on our website. So in probably about a week, if you go to friendsofhaystackrock.org and go to our library lecture series, you will be able to click on um, Dr. Selena and it will be this talk here right now. That's great. Oh. And of course, if you have additional questions, you can contact me. I may not, I probably won't know the answer, but I can put you in touch with one of our Seabird experts. I noticed that your next speaker is Dr. Rachel Orban, who's one of our faculty. So um, I'm sure that she will have great uh, information for you and will have much more specific information than I probably have too. But I just got two more questions. <laughs> great. Um, so my first, the first one is, on one slide, you mentioned the mass die-off in Oregon and Washington about a decade or two ago. Is the cause known? So the mass mortality events, the first thing that the data allow us to do is determine, is it abnormal? Because if you're a beach walker, you probably know that, for example, there are common murders that wash up on our beaches in the fall in large numbers sometimes. And so first thing we do is deter determine if it's truly an abnormal event. Then we start looking for causes. And for that, I'm, I'd have to look up that particular one um, to know, you know what the species was and if they knew the cause. But there have been um, some mortality events that are related to a an algae that, that sometimes blooms that acts kind of like a, that, that's a surfactant that uh, kind of glues their feathers together, almost like an oil. And uh, that does cause mass mortality events sometimes. And I, th I think that the Oregon one might have been one of those, um, but it'd be good to, to look that up. And I'd be happy to, to do that if you wanna email me and I can double check that with the coast folks. Um, others that have taken place, you know, it's a good way to identify if there's been an oil spill, for example. Um, it's also uh, important, like if there is a big drop in one of the forage fish species and the birds are having a really hard time finding food, um, sometimes we can figure that out. The problem is that, like I said, like sandlands aren't monitored. And that's a really critical prey item. The ones that are monitored well are mostly species that are also important to fisheries. And so that's kind of a limited part of the seabird's diet. So it's not always a direct, easy link of, OK, we have a bunch of dead birds, and here's why they died. Uh, but at least we can do some sort of correlations and see. And often what we're finding is that those mass die-offs are occurring at the same time as some abnormal event in the ocean, like a big rise in temperature. So that leads us to our next question. <laughs> um, what are the implications for commercial fishing given your finding on prey fish? Yeah, so, you know, the, what I see happening on the West Coast of the U.S. is continued um, fairly conservative uh, harvest limits, uh, like the harvest limits that were set for anchovy and so on. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sard the sardine fishery has actually been shut down for a fair number of years because the sardine do this, this long scale kind of, you know, decades of high numbers and then decades of low numbers and they're on a low point right now um so there actually hasn't been much in the way of sardine fishing for uh several years because of that um because they want to leave what's there out for the out for the birds and the fish 
Um, so I think what we'll continue to see is uh, fairly conservative management uh, and continued pressure to, con to have that conservative management. Um, but at the same time, just uh, really more focus on trying to monitor these species better. They are a critical indicator of what's happening in the California current ecosystem. And so increasing the amount of uh, uh, technologies that we can use to monitor them is gonna be really important. Well, I think that is the end of our questions. I want to thank you again so much for um, participating in our extended Puff, Year of the Puffin uh, lecture series. Um, and yeah, it was such a lovely talk. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. It was great to, to meet you and to have a chance to chat with you.